Welcome to the program, Blessed Among Men and Women, with Father John Horgan, a program about the men and women the Holy Father has brought to the altar as blessed. And now, here's Father John Horgan. Welcome to our continuing series, Blessed Among Men and Women, the lives of saints and beatified persons who have been recognized by Pope John Paul II as being witnesses to the faith in the 20th century of God's work of grace. Today we're talking about Blessed Dina Belanger, who is also known as Blessed Marie Saint-Cécile. This blessed comes from Canada and spent some of her life in the United States. She was a religious and a great mystic, whose writings have caused her to be compared to St. Therese the Little Flower because of her great trust in God and her childlike confidence in the will of Jesus for each one of us. Dina was born on the 30th of April in 1897 in Quebec. Her father, Octave, and mother, Serafina, had her baptized that very same day in the parish church of St. Rock, and she was given the names Marie, Marguerite, Dina, Adelaide. But to her family and friends, she was always known as Dina. Before she was born, her mother, who was a very devout woman, would ask at Mass each day that the babe to be born be completely good, and that if it were God's will, might one day become a religious or sister. After Dina, the Belangers had another child, a little boy, but he died after only three months. Dina was a strong-willed little girl, but well-trained by her parents, she learned to carry out her life of prayer, sacrifice, study, and play with great joy. Between the ages of 6 and 12, she attended school conducted by the Sisters of Notre Dame, a Canadian community. Although at first shy and somewhat tending towards scrupulosity, she was ready to learn and ready to grow. At 8, her parents had her begin to study piano under the direction of a private teacher, and by uh, the age of 11, she had obtained her first diploma. At around this time, she began her preparation for her first Holy Communion and Confirmation, which she received in 1907. On March 25th of the next year, she seemed to hear the voice of our Lord speaking to her after Communion for the very first time. This voice, which she described as being sweet and musical, filled her with joy. Because from this time on, she began to be more attentive to the Church and to her faith and visits to the Blessed Sacraments, her friends, somewhat enviously, began to call her Saint Dina. At the age of 12, Dina began to attend classes in the local parish school. Here she joined the Association of Daughters of Mary and also made her consecration to Our Blessed Lady according to the spirit of Saint Louis Grignon de Montfort. Her motto was, Death rather than any stain. She loved to read The Secret of Mary, written by this great saint. And later, she wrote, It was from this little book that I learned how to love and serve Jesus and how to suffer for him. At the age of 14, Dina asked her parents' permission to finish her studies in the boarding school of Our Lady at Bellevue a school that was also directed by the congregation of Notre Dame. In her little diary, she wrote, My God, grant me during my stay at this boarding school never to offend you with the least venial sin. Those two years offered her the opportunity to overcome her natural shyness, her slowness in obeying her teachers, and the frequent impatiences that figured in her early report cards. On October 6, 1911, the first Friday of the month, while she was in chapel at school, Dina felt in her heart a great desire to consecrate her own virginity to the Lord. At the beginning of her second year, she found herself very interested in directing her life towards that of the sisters who had educated her. 
Her parents wanted her to wait some years before entering a convent since she was now only 16 years old. They wanted her to get to know the world a little bit, to participate in parties and dances with close family and friends. Dina acceded to their requests, but she was always faithful to the rule that had been given to her at school. Morning and evening prayer, daily mass and communion, rosary, ten minutes of meditation a day, weekly confession, and an examination of conscience every night before bed. She continued to study the piano and even received her teaching certificate in piano. Often she would accompany her mother on her visits to the poor and the sick. She joined the work of the Tabernacles, a society that was devoted to adoration of the Blessed Sacrament and providing altar linens and other supplies for poor parishes, and she joined the Apostolate of Prayer and became a promoter. When the First World War broke out in 1914, she felt in her heart a spontaneous desire to offer her life to the Lord in a spirit of reparation. In 1916, when Dina was 19 years old, she decided to go to New York to continue her studies in music at a famous conservatory. Her confessor and parish priest, Father Cloutier, suggested that she live at a small residence hotel called Our Lady of Peace, which was directed by the religious of Jesus Mary, a French community which was very active in Canada. There, she'd be able to follow her own spiritual life and also have the support and friendship of other women of like mind. She would go back to her family in every vacation and almost always spoke to her parents of her joys and her studies, in which she always received the title of excellent. In the month of June 1918, Dina returned to live with her family. For the three years up to 1921, she gave concerts, continued her piano studies, and also took students of her own. In her autobiography, she would later write that at certain moments she would hear the voice of Jesus in the depths of her heart and see in a great light with the eye of the imagination, not of the body, scenes which were very beautiful. She prayed very much not to be deceived by the devil, but the Lord made her understand that she had a mission to carry out, and yet he didn't tell her what it was. Jesus placed into Dina's soul a deep, a burning desire to accept any humiliation and any suffering for love of him. It was these thoughts and these inspirations that began to kindle within her the fire of great love and union with God, which would so characterize her whole life. In her autobiography, Dina wrote about these experiences. At the beginning, it seemed to me that he was at my side, that he was walking next to me. Later, I found him inside me. Then he gave me his spirit so that it might replace my own, his judgment so that I might value objects, events, and people in the manner that he desired. Later, he substituted his own will for mine. I experienced then a powerful force inside me which moved me towards what is good, which obliged me to refuse him nothing. I felt a great passion for holiness. During the summer of 1920, the desire for religious life so increased in Dina's heart that, together with her mother, she joined the Third Order of the Dominicans and took the name Catherine in honor of the great Catherine of Siena. Not knowing what religious community the Lord was, had chosen for her, she prayed that the Lord might enlighten her, and one day she heard within her heart the words, I want you at the convent of Jesus Mary. With her parents' permission and blessing, she crossed the threshold of the convent at Sillery in Quebec on August 11, 1921. It was then that, with great strength, she felt within her hearts the words, We are at home now. At the beginning of her postulancy, Dina found everything extremely difficult and even impossible, as she wrote later, 
she was tempted to run away. But during the retreat that she made in preparation to enter into the novitiate under the guidance of Mother St. Elizabeth, everything suddenly appeared easier for her. She decided to begin a new life, obeying blindly, suffering with joy, and loving even to the point of martyrdom. She had read an expression written on the walls of the convent to inspire the sisters, If you begin, begin perfectly, and submitted herself entirely to common life, the life of the community, even though it caused her enormous sufferings and difficulties at first, as did the occupations and assignments which were given to her. She held on to her vocation as if it were the anchor of her eternal salvation. On February 15, 1922, Dina received her religious habit, and at that time was given the religious name of Sister Mary St. Cecilia of Rome. Cecilia of Rome is the patroness of music and one of the early martyrs. On March 25th, the Feast of the Annunciation of that same year, she was allowed to make private vows to prepare her for her later religious vows. At that time, she chose as her motto, Jesus and Mary, the rule of my love, and my love, the rule of my life. From that moment on, she tried to make her life a continual prayer, wanting to remain united to the Lord in every one of her actions, even the littlest one. All of her efforts were joined together by the expression, Everything for Jesus alone. Her love for Jesus intensified the two great passions of her life, the desire to suffer and the desire for the salvation of souls. During the day she would often repeat, My God, I ask of you the grace to live and die as a martyr of love, a victim of love, and an apostle of love. Even before she began her novitiate, Sister St. Cecile had been entranced by the idea of the private vow to do always that which was more perfect in Christ's eyes. On the night of Christmas in 1922, she promised the Lord, I want to make each of my actions with as much perfection as possible. I do not want to refuse you anything. Despite Dina's good will, there were many difficult hours, dryness in prayer, temptations, and other interior trials. The mistress of novices, too, tested her virtue, her patience, and her obedience. Dina received these warnings with gratitude and with humility. In her obedience, she found the protection of her vocation and her call from God. She wrote, It is my refuge, it's my sure place. On August 15, 1923, Dina made her first temporary profession of vows. She had prepared for this profession with a retreat in which she had taken as her motto to love and to suffer. And later, in a retreat that she made at the end of the year, she seemed to hear the Virgin Mary telling her to change this motto and make it instead to love and to let Jesus and Mary act. The Mother Superior of the house, Mother St. Romuald, soon realized that there was an extraordinary union of heart and soul between the living God and Sister St. Cecile. She therefore decided to impose upon her the obedience to write down in a diary the graces with which the Lord had favored her. No other act of obedience would cost Dina as much as this one, and this obedience would continue until her death. She began her work of writing in March of 1924 at the house of St. Michel de Bellechasse, where she had been sent to teach music, and she continued it some months later while she was ill and being cared for at the infirmary at Sillery. In August of the same year, while she was getting ready to renew her temporary vows, she believed she heard the voice of Jesus tell her, You will make your profession, and a year later, on the same feast of the Assumption of my mother, I will come to take you to myself. This prediction, to her great confusion, did not take place. It was not fulfilled. To the mistress of novices, in all simplicity, she said then, I made a mistake. 
despite this humiliation, Sister San Cecilia continued to climb her own Mount Calvary in the darkness of faith, but in the light of God's love, with an absolute trust in Christ and in his will. On October 3rd of 1924, her superiors granted her quite spontaneously an authorization, a permission which they had refused her a year previously, that of making temporarily a private vow to do all that is more perfect in thought, desire, and in actions. Exteriorly, her life continued to go on without any changes in the infirmary where she was often recovering from illness. But her soul grew in its desire for heaven and an unspeakable hunger and thirst for suffering under any form for the sake of souls and their salvation. On January 25, 1925, she noticed in herself a new state of spirit, which allowed her to think that God was preparing her for a series of great graces. In fact, the following days were filled with wonderful and new lights on the presence of Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament, on the thoughts of his heart when he instituted the Eucharist, on the great mystery of the Holy Trinity, and the great desire of the Eternal Father for the salvation of all souls, and on her own responsibility for this salvation. The 7th of February, while she was feeling broken under the weight of her suffering, she heard the voice of Jesus speak within her for the first time in seven months, and say, You will not possess me in heaven, because I have absorbed you completely. She understood that what she had been feeling in the depths of her soul was that my eternity has already begun. This mystical state didn't cause Sister St. Cecile any tension or difficulty in carrying out her daily duties. Lovable, always smiling, although perhaps quiet in speech. In her sick room, she gave every kind of service that was possible for her. She would translate correspondence from English into French and help with other letters written to the community. She worked on poetry and songs for community feasts and for the schools. She would give advice to the mistress of music and do everything that was possible to be of service to her fellow sisters. In this way, she understood, she uncovered for herself day by day the value and price of the cross. In her autobiography, she wrote, If we were to understand the value of our crosses, we would remain paralyzed with joy and happiness in receiving them. To thank the Most Holy Trinity for the favors with which she felt herself so overwhelmed, Sister San Cecile took up the practice of offering Jesus, who lived within her, back to the Trinity. This form of prayer is found also in the writings and mystical experiences of St. Gertrude the Great. This was the only way to repay infinite love, to offer back the humanity of Christ within us to the Trinity. In order to become more and more like Jesus, Dina desired ardently to receive the stigmata, not visibly, but to feel the wounds of the passion within her soul. In April of 1926, Sister Saint Cecile was able to take up teaching again. She dedicated herself to it with great love and joy, and the children responded to her own happiness in teaching. She wrote, Jesus has given me his divine heart for souls. He's put me in possession of his infinite graces for souls, not for myself. Through the Holy Virgin, I can and I must draw down the heart of Jesus for all souls. I feel that my responsibility is immense. I must give and radiate love. More and more, the attraction towards the Eucharistic heart of Christ grew within her. Near the tabernacle, she felt a joy that she wasn't able to put into words, and when the Blessed Sacrament was exposed, she felt completely pervaded by the presence of Christ and his love. In the month of July, Sister St. Cecile was sent to rest for two weeks in the convent of St. Michel. 
It was there that the Eucharistic heart of Jesus began to speak to her in a very special way about consecrated souls and to ask her for prayers and acts of mortification of spirit for their sake. On the 12th of September, a Thursday, a day in which traditionally we think about the agony in the garden, Jesus said to her, Do you want to drink the chalice of my passion? She answered, My Jesus, you know that not only do I want this, but that this is my whole will. At that moment she felt her soul overwhelmed by a very difficult suffering which she did not know how to express in words. Every Thursday evening after that she would consecrate an hour to prayer to console the agonizing heart of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. At the beginning of 1927, Sister San Cecile, because of her weak health, was forced to re-enter the infirmary. It was there that on January 22nd, at the end of the 40 hours devotion which had been held in the convent, our Lord granted her the gift of the invisible stigmata. She described it in these words, During my meditation before the Blessed Sacrament exposed, I found myself suddenly overwhelmed by a great peace. I experienced the presence of my Divine Master, but there was something more than the ordinary union that I felt from Thursday to Friday. In fact, the Lord was granting me the great favor of the stigmata. From then on, every Thursday and Friday, she continued to participate in the agony and the passion of the Lord without understanding the true meaning of everything that happened. However, the more intimate her union with Christ grew, the greater within her heart did she feel the desire to suffer with him and for him and to apply to souls, especially the souls of priests, the infinite merits of Christ's heart. On August 15, 1928, Sister St. Cecile arrived at the moment of pronouncing her perpetual profession. She had to overcome terrible temptations to discouragement first, temptations which even led her to think that she should leave the convent at the end of her temporary vows. Her faults, her failures, appeared to her to be so great that she no longer trusted in the mercy of God. But she was able to overcome these temptations, and during the retreat that she made in preparation for her perpetual profession, she was given very special graces by the Holy Trinity. In 1926, Dina began to feel the first signs of tuberculosis. At Christmas of 1928, she knew that it would be the last that she would pass in this life. After communion, she renewed her perpetual vow to do only that which is most perfect. On April 30th, 1929, she was transferred with a Madonna statue in her hand into that part of the infirmary that had been reserved for people ill with contagious TB. Her parents came to her bedside, and her father said to her, We've already had so many masses said for your cure. We've recited so many prayers, but I think that you're not helping. Papa, she answered, I only want to do the will of God. Long and sleepless nights followed, in which she was devoured by fever, and the nurse on duty would hear her say over and over again, My God! How much I suffer. My God, how happy I am. On earth, she said, I haven't worked, but in heaven I will. These were the words that she spoke to her superiors. I will become a beggar of graces for my whole community. Till the end of her days, Sister St. Cecile's love for Christ continued to grow. Her only desire was that she might become more and more like Christ crucified to save many souls and so earn a great reward in heaven. She died on September 4th, 1929 in the afternoon after having received for a second time the anointing of the sick, having answered the rosary which the sisters recited around her and kissed with great devotion and love the crucifix that was brought to her lips. During that morning, she had said to Mother St. Elizabeth, who was by her bedside, Mother, I heard fifteen times voices which said, Blessed, blessed. 
In life she had not refused anything to God. Indeed, she had so identified herself with Christ that one day she heard Jesus say, Since you have left, me, allowed me to leave, live your life, I will be judged in your place. Dina was buried in the convent cemetery at Sillery, but now her relics have been moved into the Institute's chapel. Pope John Paul II recognized the heroicity of her virtues in 1989 and approved the miracle received through her intercession in 1990. She was beatified the day after her foundress, St. Claudine Thévenet, was canonized by Pope John Paul II. Dina Belanger is for all of us a model of total generosity in answering God's will and God's invitation to deny him nothing. He is a pat she is a patroness for us in the United States and in Canada because she has shared in the life of both countries and in the work of the Church here. We ask that she might intercede for all of us so that we too will learn to answer generously, trustingly, and lovingly to Almighty God and follow the little way that he has given to all of us. Through the intercession of Blessed Dina Belanger, may your days in serving Christ be filled with joy and peace, with love and with laughter. Thank you for listening today to the program Blessed Among Men and Women with your host, Father John Horkin. 